I'm doing these recordings during the age of the coronavirus. And one of the reasons for doing the readings uh, is uh, for my parents, uh, because they can't, they can't read so well, but they can listen. So um, today's chapter is dedicated to my parents who are alive and living in a retirement community, and also uh, to Miss Dolly. So I think this chapter uh, speaks a lot to, to their generation. <clears throat> the chapter is called uh, The Making of a Bootlegger, and it's chapter 10 uh, in the book. The Making of a Bootlegger. Why did you start making wine? Not an unusual question posed to a winemaker, as common as, how are you? What do you do? Why did you plant a vineyard? If the why question were about climbing a mountain, you might answer, because it was there. Also, a legitimate answer if you asked why you're growing grapes when you live in California, and what Paul replied the year he binged Mount Everest expeditions on Netflix to relax evenings during a strenuous harvest month. The climax of the winemaking season was the equivalent of summiting a great peak, starting the months-long journey by foot at a village in sub subtropical foothills. It took about as much effort and was as rewarding. Why did you do it? <clears throat> we planted a vineyard because the land was there, Paul told the San Diego Union Tribune reporter. We live in California and that's what everybody does around here does. I don't see everyone planting vineyards. Why did you? She persisted, writing about the region's growth in boutique wineries. My dog told me to, he answered. He wanted to meet Lassie and he needed more room to run around. So it made sense to move out to the country and plant grapes. Assuming you ask the question in earnest, you deserve an answer more thoughtful than because it was there and the dog made me do it. Here's what I know. Unlike Carrie Ann, who converted to wine in adulthood after being baptized with a drop of beer under her, her Teutonic tongue, Paul was born into a family that appreciated wine and seafood and a collection of raw oysters, clams on the hash shell, steamers, mussels, and sashimi, fish steam poached and grilled, and yes, even seaweed, which he learned to call kelp in the second grade, and nori when he learned Japanese. The closest Carrie Ann ever got to seafood was Rocky Mountain oysters and fried gator. As soon as Paul was old enough to eat solid food, his mother fed him fish sticks from the supermarket's frozen food section, along with an occasional jalapeno popper by mistake. The day Paul's father introduced him to raw oysters and clams in the half shell, the youngster slurped the mollusk with delight, beginning a lifelong quest and insatiable desire for the perfect buff dive. His father grilled shrimp and prawns at the barbecue, while inexpensive restaurants along the Pacific Coast Highway offered the young family affordable fish tacos. The only time seafood disagreed with Paul was the day he came home from college, and his father brought a, a bush, bushel of oysters they pried open with knives. Since they all loved oysters and Rocky Road ice cream, to show everyone how smart he was, Paul put a dollop of the sweet, creamy dessert on top of the salty, seaweed-infused mollusk, despite his father's admonition. Paul pretended to relish his first culinary blend. As his stomach lining tightened, gastrofluids flowed, saliva glands in his mouth opened, and his mind switched from creative gourmand mode to do everything in his power to avoid regurgitation. Never again did he combine ice cream and oysters on a spoon. A similar reaction happened the first time he mixed abundant quantities of beer and wine in high school. Never again did he combine those two in adolescence, although during frequent trips to Japan and China, he drank everything his host served. Eventually, he discovered it takes good beer to make great wine. Cheers. Paul's upbringing as a quasi-pescatarian Episcopalian was not preordained. His father, Jimmy, was born and raised in landlocked Richmond, Virginia in 1932 at the depths of the Great Depression, President Herbert Hoover's last year in office. The family's diet consisted of bacon, eggs, sausage, grits, and biscuits for breakfast, the eggs fried in bacon grease, an ample supply secured by pouring leftover bacon drippings into a tin can next to the kitchen sink. His grandmother, who never broke the yolk of an easy over egg, saved grease in a can with the same enthusiasm Paul saved vegetable scraps in a bucket. Lunch. 
Fresh tomatoes on white bread covered with mayonnaise topped with leftover bacon. Dinner. Pork chops. Skillet fried in recycled bacon fat. Vegetables. Lima beans. Butter beans. Black eyed peas. Okra and corn. And when there was dessert, chocolate pudding pie with whipped cream or banana cream pie with vanilla wafers on top. Whenever the family drove to Virginia Beach or the North Carolina Outer Banks, they returned with an ice chest bursting with shrimp and blue crabs eagerly steamed, doused with Old Bay, dissected and devoured over a table covered with newspapers, a treat to be cherished. One day, Jimmy's father brought home a box of peeping chicks so they could harvest their own eggs. As a son of the South descended from a line of North Carolina tobacco farmers on his mother's side, Jimmy was born into the Baptist church. He took it upon himself to save the eternal souls of the chicks by baptizing them in the goldfish pond behind the house. None survived. From that time onward, he gave up trying to bring chicks and people to Christ, including himself. Jimmy attended Robert E. Lee Elementary School, named after the Civil War general, and was proud of it, writing his high school thesis on General Lee. I met Jimmy several times at Paul's house, and there was something stoic about his character. He tried to live his life with the integrity of General Lee. His generation fed the mythology of Lee as an honorable, patriotic Virginian. The family had a modest two-bedroom house not far from Richmond's minor league baseball stadium and the African-American community. Richmond was segregated and train tracks divided the two neighborhoods. Times were tough, and most families did everything they could to save money. So Jimmy and his younger brother ventured to the other side of the tracks to get their hair cut, where, where it was less expensive. The barber shop was the social center in the black neighborhood, an informal club of the men's community, and the two white kids, very much out of place, were welcomed. The youngsters looked forward to the tall tales and infectious laughter every six weeks when they visited. They were all poor and got along. When Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, Jimmy's father pulled out an atlas to see where Japan was located. Look how small they are, old pop said of the Japanese archipelago. We ought to whip the Japs in a few months. Since the war was on, the family planted a victory garden giving Jimmy his first taste of agriculture. He pinched suckers off tomato plants and trained fruit-laden vines to stakes. During summer months, young Jimmy was sent down to his mother's ancestral farm near Creedmoor, North Carolina, a small town along Tobacco Road 15 miles east of Durham to assist his uncle and country cousins as the regular farmhands had gone off to war. On his mother's side, the family's history in North Carolina went back to 1725. Jimmy claimed his relatives earned the Tar Heels moniker for the state because they moved so slow picking tobacco. During the War of Northern Aggression, according to family lore, his relatives served at the Battle of the Ironclads, the Monitor versus the Merrimack. It must have been a big boat to accommodate all his kin who were there. Hey, Jimmy, want to ride the horse? His cousin Lane offered. No sooner did Jimmy straddle the frisky beast than Lane whipped it with a stick, and the city slicker kid took off at ludicrous speed as his cousins whooped and hollered. Jimmy hung on as far as the barbed wire fence that cushioned his landing. The others, seeing him cut up pretty bad, ran over to extract their bloodied cousin, younger cousin from the wire. You're not going to tell on us, are you? No. Okay, we'll let you ride the horse again. You promise you won't hit him with the stick? We promise and swear to God upon our grandfather's grave. So Jimmy pulled himself onto the back of the horse as Lane, keeping his promise not to hit it with a stick, pulled the belt from his pants to whip its hind quarters. This time Jimmy missed the barbed wire and the older boys laughed and hollered as he flew to the ground. All the commotion brought Aunt Moselle out of the house where she had been cooking up a feast with the help. Jimmy, stop horsing around and get to work or we'll have to send you back to Richmond. In addition to menacing country cousins, the farm's rooster stalked Jimmy as if he knew his history baptizing chicks, goring his buttocks. Jimmy learned to avoid the rooster, get along with his cousins, and get back on the horse. One of his tasks was to steer that horse until replaced by a mule, harnessed to a flat sleigh through rows of tobacco and ferry the leaves to the barn. 
Priming and curing tobacco was hard work during hot and humid Carolina summers. The stronger men walked from plant to plant, choosing the riper leaves, stripping them from the bottom, like slicing a large slab of like slice, slicing a large slab of meat for tacos pastor, leaving less ripe leaves higher up the stalk for later. At the barn, women flattened the leaves, tied them together, then wrapped them around a spool. Older boys climbed to the vaulted ceiling, lugging lugging the heavy spool, hung it, then lowered the sheet of stitched tobacco leaves as if lowering a shade. Unlike segregated Richmond, out here, men and boys, black and white, work side by side, telling jokes, stories, and lies, sharing the same water pump to drink. When lunch was served, the coloreds, as they were politely called, ate in one area on the lawn, often joined by Jimmy, and the whites in another, and after lunch they toiled alongside. Old Buck and Old Blue were two African-American sharecroppers living on the property with their families. Jimmy observed their young womenfolk eating red clay they dug near the watering hole. Old Buck joined Uncle Samuel and the boys in the fields while Old Blue, an elderly man born a slave, no, no longer able to work in the field, assisted Aunt Moselle and the women in the kitchen and sat on the porch, porch churning milk cream from their cows into butter. After the tobacco was hung, Uncle Sam started a wood fire in an outside brick oven that fed into the barn and carefully monitored the temperature to cure the leaves to perfection. One of Jimmy's chores was to tend the fire at night, keeping the temperature consistent, which is when old Buck taught him new curse words, how to smoke, and how to play dice. Jimmy had an aptitude for dice and once won two dollars from Buck in a crap shoot-off, the only person in memory to walk away with a victory over Buck. During the long evenings monitoring the fire, Old Blue entertained the youngster with stories and folk songs and taught him how to play guitar. When summer ended, it was back to the city and school with less time for horsing around. But when there, wit but when there was time for play, Jimmy was drawn to the railroad tracks. He joined a group of kids on the other side who regularly played stickball. Jimmy left the field one evening to head home and ran into his father. What the hell are you doing playing with those niggers? Don't you ever let me see you playing with them again. To avoid the wrath and belt of his father, Jimmy stayed away, but didn't understand the rationale for his father's prohibition. During the summer, he was, he was back on the North Carolina farm where everyone worked side by side, jived, and drank from the same dipper. But in town, when whites walked down the street, coloreds got out of the way. The summer he turned 13, they heard a secret weapon had been dropped on Japan and the war was over. Lane gave him his first taste of moonshine and the older boys raced their Ford 100 miles per hour over dirt road without seat belts or injury. Jimmy entered Richmond's Thomas Jefferson High School and as kids and teenagers were expected to earn their own spending money, Jimmy had a paper route and worked in the post office during the busy December. That summer, no longer needed in North Carolina since the regular farmhands had returned. He found work in the mailroom of Reynolds Aluminum's corporate headquarters, his first taste of corporate America. Once again, he found himself working side by side African Americans, this time college educated, articulate blacks, who, because of prejudice at the time, couldn't obtain better jobs than in the mailroom at that company. They were the strength and backbone of the department, and once again, Jimmy enjoyed, enjoyed the banter and stories while he learned colorful expressions and important life lessons from his older colleagues who were smarter than their white boss. He was raised to be polite and say, yes ma'am, and yes sir, when speaking to elders. During tennis practice, the ball bounced over the backstop and Jimmy fetched it. He passed an African-American man, said good day, had a brief conversation, and excused himself saying, nice talking with you, sir. When he returned to the court, the coach, a member of his family's church, berated him and instructed him never to call a nigger sir again. Jimmy silently questioned this disrespect of the tennis coach, the unfair treatment of his colleagues in the mailroom, and the hypocrisy of Jim Crow laws. In the mailroom and in the tobacco fields, they laughed at the same jokes, worshipped the same God, worked together, but weren't allowed to sit together at a movie theater, eat together at whites-only restaurants, or use the same toilet. Strange. He 
took out his frustration pounding tennis balls. Jimmy was introduced to fermented grapes the summer he graduated from high school. Four years before, his uncle returned from the war with souvenirs for all the family and gave a bottle of French champagne to his sister. The closest she ever got to bubbly was mixing bourbon with ginger ale. His mother saved it for a special occasion, hiding the bottle in a cabinet above the refrigerator. The week before Jimmy left for Virginia Polytechnic uh, Institute, the first family member to attend college. Proud pops invited neighbors and relatives over to pop the cork. My, this has to be the best champagne I've ever tasted, his mother said with a pleasant smile, knowing it had to be good because it was French. Here, Jimmy, try some. We've been saving this for you. He swallowed and coughed. The champagne had spoiled from the heat and was the worst thing he ever tasted. Paul later said to his father after complimenting his wine, I've never seen you taste a wine you didn't like. To which his father replied that wasn't true because his first taste of acetic acid champagne was unforgettably unpleasant and Paul's wines, quote, aren't as bad. Jimmy went off to Virginia Tech and joined the Corps of Cadets. His beloved alma mater was a cow college, but instead of agriculture or animal husbandry, he studied mechanical engineering during the week and partying, partying on weekends as a member of VPI's German Club, which organized dances and concerts for students. He made his mark as a freshman before the big football game against arch rival University of Virginia when, after midnight, he climbed the water tower overlooking the stadium and painted the letter three of the class of 53 with a four. When the sophomore class woke, there was pandemonium and the upperclassmen called the freshman into line for inspection. There was Jimmy, hands splattered with white paint. Subject to the cadet's code of honor, he could not tell a lie and confessed to being the lowliest, scummiest rat in VPI's history. And though he gained a hero status among his classmates, paid for the honor with weeks of midnight patrol, it was worth it. At the last dance, he organized senior year as a farewell to the school. Jimmy blackened his face with Kiwi shoe polish. Inspired by fond memories of Old Blue, bless his heart, Jimmy took the stage and crooned a heartfelt rendition of Carry Me Back to Old Virginia. His friends remembered as long as they lived. Carry me back to old Virginia. There's where the cotton and corn and taters grow. There's where the birds warble sweet in the springtime. There's where this old darkie's heart am long to go. There's where I labored so hard for old Massa, day after day in the field growing green baca. No place on earth do I love more sincerely than old Virginia, the state where I was born. I bet Old Blue was looking down from heaven, smiling at the young man he mentored, singing along in harmony. After graduation, to fulfill his ROTC obligation, Jimmy caught up with the army in Korea, more or less peaceful by the time he arrived, joining the Corps of Engineers. He observed observed many bored men, but was excited to be in a new country and vowed to make the best of the situation. He wasn't involved in any direct firefights, but studied skirmishes and battles that that occurred earlier, beginning his analyses by asking, what would Stonewall Jackson have done? Here's a letter he sent to his parents from Korea. Dear folks, I apologize your undutiful son hasn't written for so long. Earlier, there was a lot of time on our hands for letters. One thing has led to another. I'll try to make up for it with a longer letter this time. You can always tell when a Korean enters a room, he stinks with garlic. I finally got a chance to try local food. They call it kimchi, worst thing I've ever eaten. To be polite, I finished everything on my plate. I should say plates. They served it on so many small plates. I paid for it for a case of the shits. Please excuse my army language. Your boy is now a man. By the time, by the time I was better, We had to prepare for an inspection by our new commanding officer. Everyone was worried what kind of SOB he was going to be. Ends up, he went to tech. We got along swell. 
I had signed up for a lot of equipment and found out that I was personally responsible to the U.S. government for everything I signed. So I made sure it was all accounted for. I've never been so cold. Hot showers are a luxury. Usually my bath is a small pan, not pleasant when I was under the weather from that kimchi. My request, my request to transfer to 24th Infantry Division was granted. These are the boys in the front lines in rugged terrain who bore the brunt of fighting. I'm glad I joined them. From the top of our hill, I can see the DMZ, uh, the, demilitar the demilitarized zone. Their troops are on the other side. Even though fighting has stopped, most people at home don't realize we're here for strategic reasons. Our frontline position prevents another war. We had combat maneuvers a couple weeks ago, and I got to play soldier for a week. Enclosed is a picture of your son, the soldier. This will surprise you. The army is integrated. There are blacks who live in a concert hut with us. They're good people, and we get along. There's no trouble at all. Pop, I know this will make you angry, but I never understood back home why they were treated so badly. The only difference between us and them is we grew up on different sides of the same track. We had a bit of excitement the other night when a Korean police armor officer ran shouting into our camp after 9 p.m. Some of our men were in trouble. We couldn't understand everything he was trying to tell us, so we scrambled to investigate. It was raining. There was mud up to our shins on much of the road. We arrived at the scene after midnight and found the jeep had slid off the road into a rice pit, patty with mud blocking the doors. Fortunately, our men were unheard. One of them lives in the hut next to ours. He's a black man from St. Louis, about my age. We've become friends. Uh, to thank us for rescuing his Jeep, Leroy threw us a dinner, making ribs. Best food I've had here, even better than Bill's barbecue. Looks like it's official. I'm going to be a short timer, only 73 days ago. I was offered a commission to stay in the Army, but I want more adventure in life than being part of a regimented organization. Looking forward to R&R. &R. I want to see the cherry blossoms. My buddy gave me the name of Taylor in Tokyo, and I'll see about getting cashmere coats made for you. Much love, Jimmy. With warmer weather and a change of seasons, all that mud dried. They, ret they returned from a march covered in white dust. Jimmy glanced at Leroy and Josh. Nice white face. They were fortunate to have a shower, and Leroy spun the tip of his towel into a wasp tail and stung Jimmy's behind by his rooster scars. <laughs> nice red face. One evening, in the Seoul Officers Club, Jimmy met other tech alum alumni to drink beer. The local so soju, vodka, tell stories and play dice. No one could beat him. A major in the Army's tactical air wing who flew single-engine aircraft to spot enemy artillery positions, had news. Their good friend Doug in Japan received discharge orders and was preparing to return to the U.S. Now, Jimmy hadn't seen his classmate for a long spell and suggested after the third shot of soju, they fly to Japan to send him off properly. The major had several air aircraft in his disposal and agreed, prompting Jimmy to break out with an improvised fight song Hokey, 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 hi, tech, tech, VPI, solar X, solar raw, off we fly, Yopania, to say good, say to Doug goodbye. Had there been any Texans in the officers club that night, surely shots would have been fired as the Virginia boys made such a cacophony of gobble gobble calls at the end of the fight song, the Texans would have mis mistaken it for the opening of turkey season. The major filed plans for a training flight chose a two-seat, two-engine prop plane instead of a single engine, and they flew, over the, they flew over the Sea of Japan, landing at an Air Force base outside Tokyo. It was a surprise farewell celebration, and the boys toasted each other with beer, Japanese rice wine, sake, and Japanese vodka, shochu. Doug's wife excused herself to check off the final item on her Japan bucket list, bathed at a sento to fully experience local culture. She was welcomed into the bathhouse until she pulled out a bar of soap in the communal pool, causing an international incident resolved by her swift exit from the country. 
On his return to Korea, Jimmy justified going AWOL by saying, How could I refuse a superior officer? The four-hour stay was brief, but for Jimmy, it was a taste of a country he wanted more of. He returned on R&R on R &R to visit geishas, temples, and a mountain resort where he met the French artist Jacolet, who gained fame for his woodblock prints. He purchased a pair of prints featuring two cocks, one representing North Korea and the other the South, poised to fight, and for his parents, a set of Noritaka china and cashmere coats. He also purchased an original print from the Japanese master Ikeue artist Hokusai. He treasured as much as a lithograph used to film The Little Mermaid, signed by Disney's artistic director. Jimmy landed in California a few days to be processed before completing his tour of duty in Georgia. After winter in Korea, the prospect of palm trees and warm weather lured him west when he walked out the Army's gate as civilian. Companies were eager for young engineers, including one near Los Angeles, a Corps of Engineer buddy and fellow VPI alum recommended. Jimmy bought a clunker and drove across country to Los Angeles and after a day of interviews, was hired. The company was W.E.D. Enterprises, named after the initials of its founder, Walt Elias Disney. During the week, Jimmy worked on various robotics projects. He was part of the team that engineered President Lincoln for Disney's Hall of Presidents, and on weekends, surfed with friends. He had learned to body surf at Virginia Beach and had a natural love for the ocean. As a young veteran who had served his country without battle scars, these were happy, carefree times with the salary. As their surfing improved, their quest to ride the perfect wave brought them to San Diego. For Jimmy, this was the promised land, as much of San Diego was undeveloped. He entered the wilderness of Torrey Pine State Park with its high sandstone cliffs, wide open beaches, clear water, and pounding waves. The San Diego trip was as eye-opening as his first visit to Japan, and he began thinking of purchasing property in the area. While at work, he and his teammates imagineered the mechanical wonders of Disneyland. One July evening, after twilight surfing in Santa Monica, Jimmy and his surfing buddies headed to Nathan Al's Deli in Beverly Hills. As they walked to an open table, Jimmy was distracted by a young woman waiting to be discovered by a Hollywood talent agent. She hooked Jimmy instead who tripped on her purse. It wasn't an auspicious first impression, but Jimmy couldn't keep his eyes off her, and when she rose to leave, he strode to her table without stepping in her handbag to introduce himself properly. After her third date, she sent him this letter. Dearest Jimmy, I had a marvelous time. I think we got to know each other much better. Perhaps I'm a little different from most girls my age. I've seen and been exposed to life. By this, I mean the realities and disappointments. This makes me more understanding of others, their problems, their aspirations. I think you are very, very special and wonderful. Honestly, you completely snow me every time you open your mouth, who's who and all that stuff. I'm really impressed. Darling, what did I do to deserve you? Enough of this mush. The stars are beginning to gape in my eyes. Very simply, I love you very much. It's not the giddy, dizzy type, but a love that is quiet, peaceful, and one that grows with each passing hour. Hope Friday will come here soon. Lovingly, your Minnie Mouse. They married three months later. Paul was almost born in the ocean, his mother breaking water floating over waves at Santa Monica Beach while Jimmy surfed. Eight years later, his youngest sister burst from the birth canal with a direct nosedive into the saltwater sea, Paul's mother a believer in new age natural birth techniques. Like the first pancake poured on a griddle, Paul wasn't the best looking or strongest among his siblings and cousins. Those days, expecting mothers kept up their smoking and drinking, stunning his growth. The family's first house was 1,200 square feet in Glendale, and on weekends they drove to Malibu or Santa Monica and sometimes to the less crowded beaches of San Diego, with dreams of owning a home there someday. Before Paul could crawl, his parents took him to the beach, 
where he clung to his father's shoulders like a baby ba baboon, while his father tread water above gentle waves. Paul carried an unconscious image of his father's strength brought to the forefront when he became a father and taught his kids to swim. And eight decades later, when he, when he saw those once broad shoulders hunched, lift Jimmy's frail body out of a thermal hot tub. Paul's introduction to alcohol, not counting what he sipped through his mother's placenta, came shortly after his first birthday. Jimmy returned from work, plucked an orange from a tree, cut two wedges, and placed them into the old fashions he mixed. The one-year-old motioned for a bite, and Jimmy obliged his son with a bourbon-soaked wedge. After his father stepped outside to grill and his mother went to the kitchen, Paul crawled, crawled to the coffee table, pulled himself up, and not finding an orange slice, sipped the beverage itself. When his mother returned, Paul stood with his back against the wall giggling, and by the time his father arrived, he had slid down the wall with a smile. Should I call the doctor? his mother asked anxiously. What are you going to say? Doctor, my, my baby drank my old fashioned. What do I do? He'll be fine, Jimmy said. Indeed, Paul recovered. And whenever he coughed from a cold in later years, his father's remedy was to mix a shot of bourbon with a spoonful of sugar to sip. Walt Disney said, if you can dream it, you can do it. And though it would take several years for Jimmy to achieve his dream of owning a house where he could walk to the beach, by the, pi by the time Paul started first grade, family had purchased a modest home in the northern part of San Diego adjacent to Del Mar. Paul entered kindergarten at Del Mar Heights Elementary, where the principal stood at the entrance saluting each child every morning. Paul discovered a bird's nest in the backyard with blue eggs. Curious, he picked, he picked up one with thumb and forefinger that broke. The, he rubbed the yellow yolk off his hands, went inside, pulled a white egg from the refrigerator and placed it in the nest. Every day the next month, he checked to see if a baby bird hatched. He longed for a pet bird, and his father made him an anim animatronic hawk. Paul's elementary school drawings featured birds and hawks, which soared and screeched above the family's house. The school and their home had a view of the Pacific, while Jimmy had a view of the highway driving to work. Commuting was eased by renting an inexpensive studio apartment close to the office, shifting the burden to Paul's mother, who cared for the son by herself weekdays while Jimmy imagineers Disney's future, and on weekends she prepared meals for Jimmy and visiting colleagues. Company bonds forged those days lasted a lifetime, marked by annual Thanksgiving dinners attended by this cohort, cohort of Disney executives, their children, and eventually their grandchildren. And while Thanksgiving courses remained the same for decades, with Jimmy preparing all salt-cured gravlock salmon and his wife the turkey, the fruit of their loins brought fruit from their vines, as P Paul and Sheila's contribution to the feast was wine. Life didn't get better than that. Paul took swimming lessons at a nearby swim club, and one day walked outside the boys' changing room to hang his swimsuit to dry, neglecting to cover himself and his innocence, and drew attention from older kids who shouted, look at that kid over there without any clothes. Forty years later, with a house in the country, he routinely stepped outside after showering to towel himself into the sun while looking at vines. As a squirrel atop a whale boulder sounded a, pitch, a high-pitched bark, and two cockatiels, two parakeets, and two canaries sung melodies in bamboo cages Paul purchased in Shanghai's outdoor market, reminding him of the Shangri-La Hotel on West Nanjing Road and Disneyland's Tiki Room. He installed an outside shower on the back patio to experience pulsating hot water on his back, surrounded by a symphony of birds, admiring the, schools, the skies changing pallid at dusk as he scrubbed away grime from vineyard and toil. Although he enjoyed long hot showers outside before the drought, as he grew older, he avoided swimming pools and ocean breakers with as much caution with more caution than an elderly cat to the disappointment of his father, who caught waves until he could no longer walk, carrying a surfboard. Jimmy's career at WED Enterprises soared like the rocket he helped design for Walt's Tomorrowland, 
When the company began looking to expand into Japan, Jimmy, who had fond memories of visiting the land of the rising sun, mentioned to his boss he had work experience in Japan and was willing to assist with efforts to open that market. When it was time to assign U.S. technical staff to assist the Japanese joint venture partner laid the groundwork for Tokyo Disneyland, Jimmy was part of the task force and flew to Tokyo several times a year in the comfort of a commercial jet instead of an open-air cockpit. Jimmy flew the family back to Virginia to visit his parents. Paul spent a night at a neighbor's who had a boy a year older and a year wiser in the ways of the world. The Richmond boy was curious about life in California. Do y'all have niggers there? What's that? You know, the people who pick up your garbage. We have garbage men. Do they have black skin? I don't know, answered Paul, who was confused. And the next day asked his father, Dad, what's niggers? Jimmy, alarmed by the question, answered sternly, Young man, don't you ever let me hear you use that word again, explaining it was a bad word, referring to Negro people who were the same as he and Paul, except with darker skin. That was the last time Paul, surprised by his father's strong rebuke, said the word, although it became seared in his conscience. That incident triggered Jimmy's memory of Leroy, he looked up his old army buddy, and, as he now managed a team at WED, hired him. As fourth graders, Paul and his friend John biked to the canyon after school to smoke Tarrington cigarettes, Tipperillo cigars, and Sir Walter Raleigh tobacco in corncob pipes. Paul took the cigarettes from his parents. The other items, along with the Marlboro cigarettes, they stole from the supermarket. Paul kept the contraband hidden in a drawer inevitably found by his mother, who demanded when he returned home with the scent of tobacco on his clothes. Where did you get these? From John's older brother, he lied. When your father comes home, I want you to tell him what you've done. Paul had two days to dwell on this punishment that would befall him, and when his father walked through the door, he confessed to smoking, but not to larceny. His father decided to humiliate his son by asking Paul to smoke in front of him, handing the boy a Tarantin and butane lighter. Paul put the cigarette between his lips, lit it, and took a couple of quick puffs to get it going. Now inhale, demanded his father, who expected the youngster to gag and turn green. Paul took a long drag, held the smoke in his lungs several seconds, exhaled smoke rings, then repeated, astonishing his father. Son, I wish I could give up smoking, but it's hard for me. It would be a shame for you to get started. When we were growing up, we all smoked, and when I was in the army, it was a thing for young officers to do to show everyone we were mad. Fortunately, by the time you're 18, the Vietnam War will be over, and you won't need to go to war. I don't want to see you start smoking and get hooked. Dad, let's make a deal. Let's both stop. Groovy, son. Cool idea. Let's do it. Paul gave up sm smoking except later in life when he was extremely drunk or when he was in a pickle in China and smoking could break the ice or diffuse a tense situation. And his father enrolled in a course to quit, started tracking when he smoked, and within a year kicked the habit. After the smoking episode, Paul's mother told her husband, I'm concerned about Paul. He's in the fourth grade and already getting into trouble. It's time for the family to start going to church. Jimmy knew this was a battle he couldn't win. So he gave it. They started attending the one church in their community, St. Peter's Del Mar, an Episcopal church. Jimmy thought members of that denomination knelt too many times, and he had no idea when to cross himself. The service was impossible for an outsider to follow, but to set a good example for his children, he dutifully brought the family to worship services most Sunday mornings during the school year, skipping summer months. In fourth grade, Paul studied the Golden State Settlement by Spanish missionaries. Each student was required to build a replica of one of the missions, with Paul assigned San Juan Capistrano, 50 miles north of Del Mar. His father could recite Virginia's history and the story behind each statue along Richmond's Monument Avenue, 
but knew little about California history and was eager to assist. He drove Paul to the mission and was impressed uh, by the crumbling facade, the swallows, and an exhibit depicting conquistadors making wine. The Imagineer assisted his son construct a model with details as fine as Cinderella's castle, with Paul beginning to display a lack of talent being handy, his only contribution rec recommending the addition of a wine barrel. When Paul's daughter Kate was in the fourth grade, he took her to an arts and crafts store to purchase a prefabricated mission. On April 22, 1970, inspired by Earth Day activities across the country, Paul's father planted a vegetable garden, its boundaries made from railroad ties containing who knows what to toxins that leached into the soil, the plants, and their bodies. For Jimmy, the garden brought back memories of the victory garden he had when he was his son's age and was a source of relaxation after a week at the office. Tensions diminished, diminishing as he pulled suckers off tomato plants. Jimmy grew lettuce, tomatoes, green beans, and squash explaining to his children the benefits of organic produce, ignoring the railroad ties. Jimmy taught his son how to pull suckers and train vines, but Paul preferred practicing penalty kicks in the backyard, seeing how close he could propel the soccer ball over the tomato plants. When he missed, it was time for quick triage to repair the damaged plants before his father noticed. When Paul entered Earl Warren Middle School, foreign language choices were French, or Spanish. He chose French because his father had traveled to Paris to explore feasibility for a European Disneyland and returned saying, I wish I spoke French. Who could have seen the wannabe soccer star who didn't share his father's passion for surfing would be attracted to international business. Although he grew up in a city that shared a border with Mexico in a household that employed a Hispanic maid and gardeners, Paul would learn several languages Spanish, not one of them, until later in life, when he studied enough to taunt Miguel. He began French, and he struggled. Those were early days of California's wine renaissance, and his parents drank Almaden jug wine from California's Central Valley. As a youngster, when Paul had a play date at a friend's, He'd return the hospitality and invite his friend to visit his house, suggesting, Your mommy looks like she'd like to drink wine with my mommy. By fifth grade, Paul refreshed his parents' glasses during cocktail hour, sampling a sip before passing the glass to his mom and then a sip from his father's. He listened to radio commercials for Hey, 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 Matus Rosé, his first memory of blush wine. He liked Matus and a little blue nun more than Boone's Farm Strawberry Hill. Jimmy's trips to France expanded the family's palate when he returned with bottles of Grand Cru Classé from Bordeaux and saint Emilion. Paul trialed at, a dinner t at the dinner table and liked. Paul's mother, an excellent cook, prepared Chateaubriand, broiled tomatoes from the garden, scalloped potatoes, and freshly picked salad, accompanied by French wines Jimmy carried back from his trips, from his trips for, his, for his entourage of Disney colleagues. Jimmy's stockbroker at Merrill Lynch called with a tip. The company that made Almaden was raising money. Jimmy attended a road show for investors and during the question and answer period asked, how long do y'all age your wine? That depends, answered Almaden's president on how far away the store is from our winemaking operation. Jimmy passed on the investment. Although Paul was sampling France's finer things, his father brought him Souchard chocolates, croissants, and a can of pâté de foie gras, he was failing in French class and asked the smartest girl for help. Rachel and Paul met to review van der Tramp, irregular verbs. She explained how to conjugate French verbs and drilled him on pronunciation, she demonstrating perfect lip puckering technique. Ah, seventh grade, hormone stirring, bubbles of arousal, rising, first date, first dance, first kiss. The next day, Paul and Rachel sat next to each other in the back row of French class, passing notes in English. The field trip for the Spanish class that year was to Mission San Juan Capistrano, 
and Rachel suggested to Paul they go along. Why? That's for kids studying Spanish. Because it's a beautiful place, and I want to go there with you. Let me ask the Spanish teacher, said Paul, who learned one of life's important lessons. Nothing is impossible if you ask. The Spanish teacher, pleased by Paul's enthusiasm for Hispanic culture, was all too happy to have him and Rachel join the field trip. It didn't hurt that Jose Rodriguez was assistant coach of the boys' soccer team and admired Paul's promising ability. As they passed through the mission gate, the first thing that caught Paul's attention was an old wooden barrel. Rachel, look, when I built my mission in fourth grade, I included a wine barrel. There it is. Which mission did you build? Santa Barbara. I bet you got an A. I didn't do so well. What happened? The teacher didn't like me. Why not? She was Catholic and didn't like it when I asked questions about the treatment of Indians at the mission. Really? She made me stay after school and write on the board 100 times. I will not disrupt the class. I had to stay after school and write on the board. I would always ask permission when I was in the third grade. By fourth grade, I was a model student. I doubt it. Your best subject is soccer. The group was ushered into the mission's chapel for an organ demonstration, and Paul and Rachel moved to the back pew where they could whisper unnoticed. As they listened to the music and admired the, charpo- the chapel's artwork, Rachel took his hand into hers. He wasn't sure what to do for a moment, then gently squeezed her hand in return. As they were still so young, about three-fifths the size they would become with less than half the knowledge. They hadn't studied physics, but had just proved Sir Isaac Newton's third law of motion. When a couple is in, in equilibrium, a force exerted by one will generate a reaction equally strong by the other. This state of equilibrium lasted into Paul's young adulthood when, if a woman took his hand, he take hers and follow it with a kiss as a demonstration of Newtonian acceleration. The students were led outside to view the decaying facade of the original chapel, a crumbling, wailing wall to migrating birds that made Capistrano famous, but whose numbers were dwindling as the once magnificent chapel built to glorify God and bring the good news of Jesus Christ, the savior of the world, the savior of Native Americans, fell into disrepair. Rachel pointed to a crack in the walls. Paul, look, two swallows up there. Look at them. They were cooing with the male just gesticulating at the female, expanding his chest, performing a courting dance. They're in love, she said. Isn't it romantic? And she placed a soft kiss on his cheek, which froze the 12-year-old boy. The group's chaperones called the students to board the bus. Ladies first, Paul said to Rachel, allowing her to board, as she strode to the back row where they sat with no one behind them. When the bus was on the interstate, Paul took her her warm, moist hand. He was a fast learner, and she rested her head upon his shoulder. Puppy love. Alas, Rachel became ill missed a semester, and they didn't speak again until their 30th high school reunion. In the summer of eighth grade, Paul's friend John had discovered his father's double-barrel BB gun. Paul persuaded his parents to buy him a BB gun, and the boys started with paper targets, then graduated to cans, bottles, squirrels, and eventually each other. Paul shot a dove from a tree and pumped a dozen BBs into its chest before it stopped flapping and twitching. Windows in the neighborhood winced as the boys walked by and their accuracy improved. From a distance of 200 feet, the boys fired at their neighbor's beehives and white boxes with honey collecting in jars and hit the mark. A week later, Paul's father casually mentioned the beehives had been vandalized. Really? replied Paul. I don't know anything about it. Young man, you're a real pain in the neck, Jimmy declared. You've demonstrated you're incapable of handling the responsibility of owning a gun, and worse, you lie. 
Those words reverberated in the caverns of Paul's memory four decades later, when his father went under the surgeon's knife for neck surgery, for which Paul's wine offered no cure other than as a painkiller. Jimmy confiscated his son's gun. He knew what boys with BB guns could do, because when he was, was Paul's age, he'd seen kids from his neighborhood shoot BBs at, at trains speeding down the tracks by his house. Paul gave up his hunting career and went back to the soccer field to drill, drill, shoot, and drill. Paul's mother, after seeing a production of the musical Jesus Christ Superstar, became a born-again Christian, although Paul couldn't see a difference because she still cussed like hell when angry. She was concerned about Paul's behavior, and the summer before entering high school suggested sending Paul to a sports camp, an idea Paul greeted with enthusiasm. Jimmy suggested Virginia Tech sports camp so his son could experience part of his father's life. So it was off to the hills of Blacksburg, Virginia, where Paul's father spent formative years learning to host parties, climb water towers, and march as the lowest rat in school history. Paul spent his time at Tech running laps, sprinting, dribbling, drilling, shooting penalty kicks, practicing plays, scrimmaging. At the end of each day, after other campers returned to their dorms, he sprinted up and down the steep slopes of Lane Stadium, about the same height as the steep part of his future vineyard ten times. His soccer skills progressed daily as he challenged taller, stronger, experienced college students who encouraged and strengthened him. Each morning, as campers ate in the dining hall, they were addressed by Tech's athletic director who taught them the meaning of intestinal fortitude, the body's waterproof, and on rainy days, and co concluded each pep talk with the rousing, what a day! Paul got along well with the rednecks in training, and at the end of the first week's campfire ceremony, was awarded a Virginia Tech paddle for good citizenship and received a bonus reward from his fellow campers as they tackled him, pinned him down, pulled down his pants, and whacked his bare cheeks with the paddle. Paul received two firebrands the next two weeks, fortunately on the paddle and not on his rear. An arrow for perseverance, as his coaches noticed Paul was the last one in the field dribbling a soccer ball around cones playing an imaginary match against Pele. The second brand was, was a heart for good sportsmanship. The paddle accompanied Paul through life and became a favorite wine-making tool to punch down grapes during fermentation. Fortunately, no wood splinters appeared in his unfiltered wine. Paul, whose crimes and misdemeanors include, included sneaking out, smoking, stealing, blowing up mailboxes, throwing oranges at cars, and vandalizing the neighborhood with a BB gun, returned to California from the summer in Virginia, exhibiting virtues of good citizenship, never giving up, intestinal fortitude, never deterred by rain, the body's waterproof, and never feeling under the weather. What a day! He was a member of the first class to enter the newly constructed Torrey Pines High School that gained a reputation as one of San Diego's best. On his 16th birthday, his father said, Son, you probably want to buy a car and go on ski trips with your friends. You should get a job to pay for those things. Work was what Jimmy's generation knew growing up, and he expected his children to work part-time. Paul returned home from soccer practice, practice one evening and was watching TV. There were no computers, mobile phones, or video games those days. His mom marched into the living room, turned off the set, turned to her son, and huffed, It's time to get a job! She offered him a lead. She had dined that afternoon at an upscale French country restaurant in the neighboring town of Rancho Santa Fe called Chez Jacques and heard they were looking for a busboy. Go there tomorrow after practice, look Jacques in the eye and ask for a job. Without Rachel's assistance, Paul spent his lunch break practicing phrases he would use during his interview. After soccer, he walked to the restaurant and observed half a dozen men sitting at a table and asked for Monsieur Jacques. That would be me. How may I help you? Paul recited, uh, Bonsoir, monsieur. Je m'appelle Paul et je cherche de travail. Avez-vous besoin d'un garçon? Jacques was delighted with his, this young American trying to speak French. Enchanté, jeune homme, he replied. 
Horst, he said to the maitre d', talk with him about the bus boy position. A fit German, with cropped hair and a thin mustache, offered a firm handshake. Are you able to work Friday and Saturday evenings? Yes, sir. Be here at 5 p.m. Don't be late. He arrived Friday evening in black pants, white shirt, and clip-on black bow tie, and was shown the silverware prep station, where he rubbed stainless forks, knives, and spoons dripping from the dishwasher. Decades later, whenever he came to our house for dinner, he rubbed his knife and his napkin when he sat down at the table. Some tabit, ta habits die hard. After drying the stainless, he put bread in an oven, stocked the refrigerator with desserts, and then, under the direction of the sous chef, mixed vinaigrette dressing he ladled on each dinner salad and when the time came. Like high-tech weather forecasters who tracked hurricanes, they knew the storm was coming. As they prepared for the onslaught, Horse complained about his skin knees. What happened, Paul asked. I was making love with my girlfriend on the floor and she dragged me across the carpet. Andre interjected, teasing Horst with his hand. Fucking puñeta! Horst, who had escaped from communist East Germany, re reminded the novice several times that evening and throughout his first month. There is no speed limit, followed by schlachten sie tot! Not words of endearment. Rancho Santa Fe is a gentrified, semi-rural community inland from Del the Delmar coast, with large homes and tracts of land, where Douglas Fairbanks, a famous actor from the last century, founded a subdivision bearing his name, and lived along with the Ray Kroc of McDonald's fame, and Theodore Zeiss, better known as Dr. Zeus. Chez Jacques was an expensive restaurant, located in the village's quaint downtown, and met its patrons high standards, who tipped well for good meals and good service. Tips were pooled and divided by Horst, Paul's first lesson in trickle-down economics, where, as busboy, he was lowest on the totem pole. As his efficiency improved, and he served customers as well as anyone, the day came when he questioned the amount he was paid in relation to others, influenced by a youthful egalitarian notion of equal pay for equal work, without the perspective of age, which would prompt him to consider other factors such as experience and seniority. Still, he made more money in high school than at any other time in his life, measured in spending power and free cash flow. He bought his father's car, handing him $2,000 cash, counting out 20 crisp $100 bills. He bought skis, paid for his own ski trips, and even the newly developed soft contact lenses expensive those days. And, as he heard stories about Europe from Jacques, Horst, and the crew, he thought about traveling to France and Germany. The word foodie didn't exist when Paul began his culinary apprenticeship by stuffing leftover morse morsels from guest plates into his mouth as he scraped them clean before stacking them for the dishwasher. Someone might leave behind a lonely escargot, one of the first foods he tasted as an infant, an uneaten clam casino, half a cordon bleu, half a sole almondine, a duck leg, a, sli a slice of filet mignon. In the heat of battle serving 200 dinners, Paul would tear a piece of meat in half with his teeth, pick up and chomp a duck leg, and dig the last nail out of the shell as he burned calories with the intensity of a furnace. He consumed as much food as he liked without concern for weight gain until he hit 40, then started training for marathons with Bluey. Of course, once he hit 50, stopped training, and started drinking wine on weekends, he set personal weight gain records. As the guests arrive, the winds pick up. Drink orders are taken and walk to the bar as a busboy, after pouring water for each guest without spilling a drop, goes to the kitchen, pulls a loaf of French bread from the oven, tucks his fingertips under his knuckles as the taught to him by the chef so he does cut them off, swiftly slices the bread, tossing it into a basket, grabs a dish of butter patties from the refrigerator as sous chef is packed with butter, chocolate mousse, creme caramels, and walks back to the table. More guests are seated, water poured, brought in butter, bread and butter fetched, drink orders taken and served. The, pacing, the pace of walking has increased to a stride. Food orders are written with pen onto a paper pad, the paper ripped 
then walked swiftly back to the kitchen and slammed on the cook's counter. Order! Heaven forbid it becomes so busy you tuck an order into your apron and in the heat of battle forget and guess ask, is our dinner coming soon? Yes, it happened, followed by a loud schlocken sie tot! As guests increase, as more alcohol is consumed, the chatter increases in intensity. The restaurant doesn't have surround sound music because the guest din covers all noise, even that of a couple who enters the phone booth and closes the door for a little nookie to celebrate with a bang. Andre detects the vibration with rhythmic pounding against the walls. Mira, he announces, fucking coño! A sea of noise waves cancels each other, except that of the swinging kitchen door, which Paul adeptly kicks open with his favorite scoring foot. Thump! Whoosh! Waiters and servers rush into the kitchen as stormtroopers. Don't slip! Taking the slip of paper, they dunk as a basketball, shouting, Order! Slapping it onto a hook. The kitchen is a four-ring circus, commanded with the precision of a Swiss chronometer by France, Franz, a Schweitzer Deutsch, and woe to the busboy who inserts a wrench into his well-oiled gears. A great training ground for a future winemaker to handle the harvest. One summer evening, Horst, Andre, and Paul, only those three, were utterly overwhelmed serving over 100 guests in an hour in time for the theater, a Broadway-bound production at La Jolla Playhouse. It was a nightmare, with friends shouting, Pick up! Pick up! He didn't want his food sitting more than 30 seconds under a heat lamp, and yelled again, Pick up! As Paul hurriedly scooped vanilla ice cream into a dish and covered it with maron and a dash of cognac, then filled the top part of an espresso maker with an Itali Italian Doro coffee, filled the container with drip coffee, and turned it over. There were no espresso machines in the, in the area those days. A meat cleaver crashed against the wall 18 inches from his head. Fuck the ice cream and pick up, demanded the chef. Paul wisely put down the dessert, choosing to serve the chef. It was the worst possible service a restaurant could provide. Paul had never been so busy in his life, except during the harvest, and at the end of the evening, Horse handed him a crisp $100 bill, the largest pay he had ever received, which in 1976 was a hefty sum for one night's work and enough to feed Andre's cocaine habit. After work, Paul joined the crew for a drink from the restaurant's bar, and the next morning, when he picked up his clothes, they reeked of stale tobacco. I breathe the same air as Betty Davis, Paul remarked after inhaling the actress smoke, uh, after inhaling the actress smoke serving her. This is the restaurant where Hollywood royalty and the rich and famous dined when visiting San Diego. Paul served Paul Newman, Truman Capote, Jason Robarts, Julia Child, quarterback Dan Faust, and sportscaster Jim McKay, whom he watched on TV during Olympic broadcast. His colleagues constituted a quorum of the United Nations General Assembly, waiters from Mexico, Santo Domingo and Austria, a dishwasher from El Salvador, sous chefs from Mexico, Puerto Rico and Peru, under the command of the chef from Switzerland, the dining room under the authority of Horst and Brendan from Ireland, who taught Paul the definition of hot Irish temper, and Jacques from France. The chef sh showed Paul how to separate egg yolks and stir them into a double boiler with butter and freshly squeezed lemon, lemon juice to make hollandaise sauce that wouldn't separate, and to add tarragon to make it a sauce bernaise. He learned how to broil meats under hot gas flames, cooking a filet mignon to perfect medium rare, and to whip a mousse chocolate. And he learned the wines in the menu and how they were priced. Jacques simply doubled the cost. The house white wine was called Chablis, Mouton Carré was a basic red, and Puy Fusse was an upscale white. Paul had never heard the word Chardonnay, while Horst called it Pussy Fusse. He learned how to dice onions, prepare a pepper steak, and an almondine butter sauce for the sole meunier. What Paul lacked in handyman skills repairing cars and building things, the stuff of real manhood, he made up for in basic cooking skills. It would be an, an exaggeration to call him a foodie. His knowledge was rudimentary. 
But years later, when Carrie Ann invited a French winemaker to the neighborhood to tour the vineyards, he called us gourmands. Sheila suggested to Paul once a month, you should open a restaurant. And what, go out of business? He'd reply. Of course, he never made a profit in the wine business that brought him to the brink of financial disaster. The fact is, his cooking repertoire was limited, but the dishes he knew he made well. My favorite was the wine reduction stew he made every winter. He had a lot of spoiled wine to cook with. The diverse restaurant crew had a common language, soccer. West Germany hosted the 1974 World Cup that brought out horse boosterism. He mustered the staff into a formidable team that defeated other San Diego restaurants. Horst, his ego inflated by the success of Germany's national team that won the cup, challenged Los Angeles champion restaurant team to a duel. They entered San Diego, they rented San Diego's polo grounds. And while the serving staff battled it out on the field, dueling chefs competed in food tents. Several hundred of their best customers attended the big match during which Horst unveiled the secret weapon, a ringer whose dim prospects at the restaurant brightened when Horst put him on the field, this time shouting Schlachten Sie tot, to encourage Paul to slaughter the opponents. Paul's inexperience at restaurant service was forgiven as he won respect from his teammates and learned uh, at age 16 how good cold beer tastes after running around a field on a hot day. Horst introduced Paul to Beck's beer, and Brendan poured him Guinness and Jameson Irish whiskey. Jacques introduced him to Chateauneuf de Pop, Remy Martin Napoleon Cognac, and Armagnac. Cognac is for export, said Jacques. Well, Armagnac is for friends. After work, they drove to Del Mar or La Jolla for more drinks and music. One evening, they heard Dave Brubeck play as Paul tapped his toe to the rhythm of Take Five at the bar, standing next to the police chief. G Good evening, chief, said the 16-year-old, saluting. Both he and Carrie Ann should have been busted for their early alcohol-fueled encounters with the law. In the brief San Diego winter, Chez Jacques employed a hat check girl, usually horse mistress at the time, who greeted guests and took their overcoats. Look at Inga, horse whispered to Paul about his voluptuous 40-year-old German girlfriend as she helped a gentleman with a coat. She's the ripest of fruits. A woman like that is perfect, waiting to be plucked. Paul was 16. And 23 years later, he recalled Horst's description of Inga and understood what he meant. Paul's life was soccer, school, homework, and working win win weekends. He missed the bonfires on the beach and house parties of his classmates, but received an education of the world. While his friends dreamed of a cross-country trip to New York City after graduation, Paul dreamed of visiting the Paris of Jacques, the Alps of France, the Berlin of Horst, and picking grapes at Chateauneuf de Pop, and plucking an Inga. Paul's father was part of the team that planned Tokyo Disneyland. And when Paul entered high school, Walt Disney Productions and the Oriental Land Company of Japan reached a formal working alliance. Jimmy began making business trips to Japan and was offered a position in Tokyo he turned down because he didn't want to uproot his children. One day, a group of Japanese business ex executives visited, their wives wearing flowery kimonos, catching Paul's attention, who insisted on walking behind the men, even young Master Paul. At a reciprocal dinner, Jimmy's family dined at the home of his senior Japanese manager, transferred to Southern California, where the younger children screamed, Godzilla, 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 and ran around the garden with intricate electronic toys. Paul dined with the adults and was served tempura and tiny cups of warm, sweet sake the kimono-adorned hostess kept full.
sealing Paul's decision to pursue an international business career and awaken an interest in Asia, a region not represented at his restaurant. Paul's poor grades in French lowered his GPA and kept him from applying to Stanford or other Ivy League schools. Too bad he never reconnected with Rachel, who could have tutored him. Her health had bounced back, and she was accepted by Yale and other top schools. Paul's heart was set on Santa Clara University in California that featured beautiful Spanish-inspired architecture, a robust, a robust soccer program, and was located in Silicon Valley with an informal corporate culture more suited to Paul's rebellionist than the East Coast. Paul eagerly tore open the letter from Santa Clara's athletic department that wished, that wished him good luck with his soccer aspirations. He wasn't going to be playing for the Broncos. The team rejected him.